So we built a language model for biology. So all of us are like, now everyone's an expert in language models. You just have to explain this to people. It's like, oh, language of biology, no one knew what I was talking about. But now it's like, I'm just saying, look, it's just like GPT, but for cells. Daphne is like the OG's OG in AI. You know, she was a pioneer at Stanford in uh, different areas of AI, especially in uh, PGMs. She left Stanford to found, uh, co-found Coursera with Andrew Ng, uh, and actually is now the a founder, uh, CEO of Incitro, a tech, com a tech bio company using AI to uh, develop drugs in life sciences. So, so Daphne, you know, given all the things you could be doing, like why life sciences? It's one of the really hard and really important problems. And there's very few things that are as challenging, as exciting as um, intervening in a safe and effective way in human health. And so it's just a thing that absolutely needs to be done if we are going to use AI for good, which I think is one of the things that um, I think I at least really strive to do. Um, the second part of the answer is why now? And what I what brought me back to this field back in um, 2016, post Coursera, was the realization that we can now finally, for the first time, measure biology at scale, both at the cellular level, sometimes at subcellular level, and at the organism level via ways of quantitating human biology. And that gives us, for the very first time, the ability to deploy machine learning in ways where it is truly meaningful to do that because the data sets are large enough for really interesting machine learning methods to be, um, to be deployed. And that's something I spent a lot of time thinking about to your point, VJ, because at, at this point, AI people can do pretty much anything. Yep. And I am a big believer in leverage. That is places where you can have a disproportionately large impact. And because of the fact that I had spent a large part of my Stanford career working in these two spaces simultaneously, core machine learning on the one hand and mach machine learning in service of biomedical data on the other, I actually have the ability to sort of bridge, be, bridge the chasm between these two very disparate disciplines. And when I was leaving Coursera in 2016 and I looked around me and I saw even at that time, which of course is a, a tiny compared to where we are today, um, that machine learning was changing the world it wasn't having much of an impact in the life sciences. And I believe one of the main reasons for that is that because there are so very few people who actually have the language of both disciplines and are able to bring them together. So I felt like I could have impact in AI across many things, but sure I could have disproportionate impact. Well, you know, you spoke about the why now. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on AI for life sciences? What's the why now there? And is there, what's different now than, you know, even what we could do even just let's say five years ago? So I think it comes back to this ability to collect, but even more than collect and generate data at scale. So one of the things that we have at Incitro that is truly unique is we have a data factory. We have put together um, the tools that um, have been developed by people who are taking pluripotent stem cells, which are cells from you or me or anyone in this audience and turning them into this pluripotent status, which can make a Daphne neuron in a dish or a Daphne hepatocyte and the dish is gonna be different than the VJ neuron and the VJ hepatocyte because we have different, um, different genetics and that's gonna manifest in how these cells um, behave and how these cells look in different measures uh, we can engineer those to introduce a disease-causing mutation and ask what does that disease-causing mutation do to a Daphne neuron versus what does it do to a VJ neuron and what does this mutation do versus that mutation. And so we're able to kind of do um, data generation on spec. And that is a truly unique capability, which frankly is not that easy to do even in other areas where AI is being, is being deployed. You don't get to make your own data in many cases, but here we do. And that creates both 
really important discovery opportunities for life sciences, but also really cool and interesting machine learning problems because you could start doing active learning, you could start to sort of do experimental design, and it's actually like a really exciting technical discipline at this point. Well, maybe you could dive a little deeper and give an example. So like uh, your, your paper on the posh uh, yeah. approach, I think, to, that came out on an archive. Could you double click on that, tell people what, what, what you did there? Especially like why is AI and life sciences a big deal? What could you hope to get? So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about that platform, uh, which is called Posh or Pooled Optical Screening in Humans. You take a bunch of cells. They can be cancer cells, but in our cases, they're mostly those induced pluripotent cells with, you know, neurons or whatever. And you put them in a, with a pool of CRISPR guides that edit them. And each cell gets a different guide. So now you have a bunch of cells, each with a genetically diverse mutation. And now they're all sitting there in a the pool and you can measure them with a microscope. You can measure them as they move around and do their thing. You can basically fix them and you sequence the barcode that came with the guide. So now you can say, oh, this cell that got this guide behaved this way and this other cell behaved that way. And I can tell you that one of the really challenging things about cells is because they're live, if you put different cells in different wells, then they each have a slightly different environment and you get subtle differences and it's really hard to reconcile. When they're all in the pool, you eliminate all of those artifacts and all of a sudden you have the ability to measure a genome-wide CRISPR screen, basically. So 20,000 genes in the genome, all modifying the same cellular background in the same dish uh, with a different genetic intervention. And you're measuring that in a genome-wide scale in like 10 or 12 plates in two weeks. Now imagine doing that rinse repeat and doing genome-wide scale on this genetic background or in this cell type. And so you can really start to decipher the genotype phenotype connection and the effect in which individual genetics makes a difference on cellular phenotypes, which we then translate to what we believe they will have in terms of clinical impact. And that is the beginning of an understanding of what it is that we want to modify in order to have meaningful therapeutic interventions. Well, yeah, but no, the, the biology part is really critical because now you get the data and we all know yeah. how important that is. But I think one of the things that's really I found intriguing is the creation of a latent space right. for human biology. Uh, and especially being able to tell the difference between disease and non-disease or even different disease phenotype. So what does that, uh, how does that come about? And like, especially, you know, how is AI driving that? So actually I'm gonna go back one step further because yeah. you said, of course, one of the things we need to do is get the data. And I should have mentioned that it's impossible to run this instrument without AI being built into it because you can't even segment the cells. You can't call the barcodes. I mean, all of it is an AI enabled architecture. Every part of our technology stack is intrinsically AI enabled. But then, to, to your point, Vijay, now you have a whole bunch of cellular images and what do you do with them? And so the first thing we do is we built this latent space. We built a language model for biology. So all of us are like, now everyone's an expert in language models. You just have to explain this to people. It's like, oh, language of biology, no one knew what I was talking about. But now it's like, I'm just saying, look, it's just like GPT, but for cells. And people think they understand. So, um, <laughs> well, well, maybe we can double click on that for today. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we have the language of, you know, cells and what cells look like or the transcriptional or gene expression profiles of cells. And you measure hundreds of millions of cells in different states. And now with a much more limited amount of data, because we have this latent space, then just like the large language models for natural language, with a small amount of data, you can start asking, okay, how does disease move you? Like a disease causing gene from one place to the other. How does a treatment move you hopefully back in the opposite direction from the disease state back to the healthy state. And that's super powerful. And it's, uh, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. Kind of like, like other language models, you have this, it keeps getting better the more data you feed it. And over time, you end up with a better and better com like competitive mode, if you will, of how does understanding the core foundations of biology um, help you understand disease and health better? And let me just say, this is not just for cellular data. The other source of data that we use is clinical data. So we do the same thing with histopathology. There's so much more in histopathology than your pathologist typically looks at. In MRI data, your radiologist doesn't see more than like a small percentage of what's there in your radiology images, but also not just imaging. There's also other modalities where there's an equal amount of information left on the table. And over time, we're learning these languages of different biological modalities and the ability to translate between them. 
I think these, this concept of foundation model for biology is particularly exciting because, um, you know, 10 years ago, you could have ML that was predictive. You just needed maybe 100 actives. Yeah. And, and the problem is, like, if you have 100 cases, examples of a drug that works, you don't need to design a drug. Uh, and so these low shot, zero shot approaches right. that come from a foundation model uh, are really night and day. So how far does this go? I mean, the big problem in biology is that biology is hard. Biology is really hard. Uh, biology is very hard. And, you know, uh, sometimes I ask myself, like, really, why am I doing this? I could go write an app for like a chat agent. You could do a Ford app or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be so much easier, wouldn't yeah, it? It would be a lot easier. But but like, so why why are you doing it? What is the big win? How does this, like, where, where, where does this go, let's say, in, by the end of the decade? Like, what could you hope to do that we can't do, couldn't do before? We want to do it in a different way. We want to come up with a very, almost like, systematic recipe for how do you go from a decision that I want to work on ALS or I want to work on fatty liver disease through a sequence of steps towards something that results in a meaningful intervention in the right patient population. The hope is that by the end of the of this decade, we will have built this process, we will have run through it a number of times, we will have delivered some medicines to patients in our first tranche of indications, but then we will have learned enough from that so that we can now say, okay, and here's how we're going to do it here, and here, and here, and because it's not only machine learning that moves forward over time, it's also the biological tools that we're relying on. I mean, it used to be that there wasn't any CRISPR. There was just siRNA, actually, there wasn't even that. And then there's like CRISPR-based editing and now there's CRISPR prime that replaces entire regions of the genome. So the tools that we're building on also get better and better over time, which unlocks more and more diseases that we could tackle in meaningful ways. Well, well, let's step back for a second because I think this may not be clear for everyone, like why biology is so hard. And one of the hmm. biggest reasons is that, you know, if, if, if we can do tons of experiments on mice, uh, you know, I have to feel like it's a great time to be a rich mouse. You could be cured of any disease, <laughs> right? Like all these diseases can be cured in mice. But, you know, it's obviously unethical to experiment on people. And that's, why, uh, that's one of the big reasons why trials fail, right? Because when you go into a clinical trial, you spend all this money to get there. You're spending all this money, hundreds of millions of dollars in the trial, and turns out mice are different than people. And it fails. Yeah. So, like, how can AI help that? So, first of all, and, and this notion of, you know, we can cure lots of mice um, yeah. is, is something that really drove our discovery strategy at in Citro, which is all of our work is done in human and human-derived systems. So that incorporates at least some subset of, of, of human cells working together. So that's one piece. And the nice thing about it is that it allows you to intervene in those systems and ask the what-if questions, the counterfactuals. Like, what if I had this person's um, biology, but in a world where this gene was doing, was inactive versus active, or the other way around? So that's great, but obviously you want to cure people, not cells or even organoids. And so the other source of data that we bring in is data from people, from clinical records. Mm -hmm. um, and what we end up doing is kind of bridging between the two using machine learning. So using machine learning on the cellular data, using machine learning on the human data, bridging between those in representation space, but also in genetic space, mm -hmm. because genetics is kind of like this thread that ties the two together. And uh, without machine learning, uh, without AI, the space would be so complex and so high dimensional that you couldn't even make sense of it, far less bridge between those two different worlds. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I'm curious to change um, uh, gears a bit and talk a bit about company building. Yeah. And one of the interesting things that you've done is that you've brought together people that are biology experts with people that are ML, AI experts. Right. And, and how do you build that culture? What does that look like, especially since they're from fairly different you know, parts of the universe? How do you build that is really hard because you take your average, you know, machine learning scientist and your average life scientist, even if they're very well intentioned, you put them into the room together, they might as well be talking Thai and Swahili to each other. The languages are different. The ways in which you think are totally different. So how do you create a shared, um, a shared language, a shared vision? Um, and so there's a few tool, tricks or, or, or approaches that we use. First of all, we hire some number of people, you can't get enough of them, unfortunately, who are in the middle, who are able to be translators and talk to both sides and kind of bring them together. Um, and then I think the other really important part is that you create a culture of, and you hire 
very rigorously to that culture of people who are genuinely interested in engaging with the, you know, the other side. And we have a list of company values. And the final value, which is one that I hold particularly dear, it's, it's last not because it's least important, it's because they're ordered from what we do to how we do it, um, which is that we engage with each other openly, constructively, and with respect. And each of those words matters. Engage means that we're not siloed. All of our work is done in like cross-functional project teams. Openly means an openness to asking really naive questions when you don't understand and to accepting really naive suggestions from somebody else because sometimes the best ideas come from an orthogonal mindset. It's something that I, I experienced even as a kid. So um, my parents are scientists and my mom warned me, no matter what I do, even though this is what I was doing as a kid because I was programming as a kid, I should not get into programming or computer science. No one's ever going to make money by selling software. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe then, you know, especially for this audience here that are coming from uh, the AI side, especially as AI gets into areas that are sort of not just the world of bits, but in the world of atoms. Yeah. Yeah. A any advice for how to bridge those gaps? Uh, I mean, first of all, having a deep respect for atoms um, is really important. Yeah, I mean, I, some of my, my closest friends are atoms. <laughs> have atoms, yes. I think we're all yeah. atoms, but I think having an appreciation for the complexity of atoms and the fact that, especially, especially when your atoms are part of live systems, they behave in unexpected, unpredictable, idiosyncratic ways that sometimes cause a lot of pain. And I, I can tell you that when you do biological experiments, one of the strongest signals when you apply machine learning to it is, what was the technician who actually did the experiments? You could read that very clearly off the cells because they behave a little bit differently. They pipette a little bit differently. They treat the cells a little bit differently. It's amazing how hard that is to clean that up, which is one of the reasons why we spend so much of our time building robots because they do the same thing over and over again. So I think having a lot of respect for atoms, but also I would say an appreciation for the fact that the next frontier of uh, what a, of the impact that AI can have is when AI starts to touch the physical world. And we've all seen just how much harder that is. We've all seen how hard it is, astonishingly, to build a self-driving car compared to building a chatbot, right? I mean, we've made so much progress on building chatbots and self-driving cars are still blocking fire trucks in San Francisco. Um, so, having an appreciation for that complexity, but also an appreciation for the magnitude of the impact if you can actually nail it. Where does this all go? Like, um, uh, you know, you're talking about life sciences in terms of healthcare and yeah. drug design, but there's a lot more to biology than just, uh, than just drugs, right? But where, where do you think this confluence between AI and life sciences goes from here? So I actually think that there is this incredible opportunity at this point, at this intersection between the two fields. And I will kind of think, I think about it from a little bit of a historical perspective of think back on the history of science. And at certain times in our history, there have been eras where a particular scientific discipline has made incredible amounts of progress in a relatively short amount of time because there was kind of like a click where we started to uh, see the world in a different way or there was a tool that wasn't available before. So if you think back to you know the late 1800s, that was chemistry where we suddenly realized you know we couldn't really turn lead into gold and there was this thing called the periodic table and there were electrons and it, it really um, shifted chemistry. And then in the early 1900s, obviously that discipline was physics and the connection between, uh, between energy and matter and between space and time completely shifted our understanding of the universe. In 1950s, that discipline was computing where we get these machines that perform calculations that up until that point, only a human was able to perform. And then in 1990s, there was this interesting bifurcation. Uh, on the one side, there was data science that ultimately, you know, that, that drew on computers, but also had elements of neuroscience and optimization and statistics and ultimately gave us modern day machine learning and AI. And then the other side was what I think of as quantitative biology, which was the first time where we actually started to measure biology in a scale that was more than like track 
three genes across an experiment that took five years. And that was the first uh, microarray data and the first human genome and, and so on and so forth. And I think this, this time that we're living is the time when those last two disciplines are actually gonna merge. And they're giving us um, an era of what I think of as digital biology, which is the ability to measure biology at unprecedented fidelity and scale, interpret the unbelievable masses of data, different biological scales and different systems um, using the tools of machine learning and data science and then bring that back to engineer biology using tools like CRISPR, genome editing, and so on, so that we can make biology do things that it would otherwise not want to do. Well, like what? So I think there's obviously, as we said, applications in, in human health, but I think there's ap applications in agriculture. I don't think we need to tell anybody anymore, although there's still some people who might need to hear it about the impact of global warming climate change on our on our world and the fact that we need to have crops that are much more resistant to drought and severe weather. And, and to um, feed 10 billion people. To feed 10 billion people. Um, I think there is uh, opportunities in the environment um, to maybe do better carbon sequestra sequestration using uh, maybe plants or, or algae or who knows what. I'm, I, I actually wish I knew more about that because yeah. that is my alternate life would have been yeah. to do that. Yeah. Um, well, there's still time, right? Well, there's still time. <laughs> yes. um, so are you funding me for that, uh, DJ? Uh, 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 let's, you, you come up with the deck, we'll talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, <laughs> so there's that. Um, I think there's, you know, uh, biomaterials and so on. There's so many opportunities at this intersection that I would encourage any of you in this audience who are looking for something truly aspirational and exciting to do. I think this convergence is a moment in time for us to make a really big difference in the world that we live in using tools that exist today that did not exist even five years ago. Yeah, yeah. with that, I think that's the opportunity at hand. Um, and we will wrap up there. Let's thank Daphne one more time. <laughs>